Cool. Well, Olivia, thank you so much. It's great to connect with you. And I'm so glad you came on the podcast today. Um, for people that don't know you, maybe you can chat a little bit about you know your background, what you do, and what uh, ailments that you've had recently in the last few years and and go from there. Okay, well, thank you for having me on. <laughs> I'm yeah, glad to be here. Um, yeah, so my name is Olivia. I'm 20 years old, and I've been a carnivore for about a year and a half now. I'm a ballet dancer. I'm a late ballet starter, which isn't common since it's a very difficult sport slash art form. Um, and yeah, I uh, was expo exposed <laughs> to mold. Uh, I had heavy metal poisoning, some radiation, uh, a lot of things, some emotional trauma as well, which I've been able to heal, depression, and all those fun things mixed up together. And uh, currently I've healed a lot of them, still healing a few things, uh, such as parasites and probably still a bit of the mold. But um, yeah, that's summed up who I am. <laughs> Okay, awesome. And then, so you said you were doing carnivore. Like, what what brought you to carnivore first? Were, were you sick with something, or did you just want to try it? Yeah, so uh, I began my ballet training in 2017. And in 2018, because my whole school was covered in mold, uh, I began to gain a bit of weight, and it was just inflammation. So I thought, well, I just need to lose weight. <laughs> So my mom told me about keto, and then eventually after uh, doing a lot of YouTube searches, we started getting Sean Baker recommended based off the keto <laughs> searching. And so that's how we originally found carnivore. And I went carnivore at the age of 16, so in 2019. And due to the environmental factors, we didn't know I had mold or some other issues such as the radiation poisoning or joint pains and things like that. Um, also, we couldn't source the meat properly. So we didn't do enough research either into carnivore. So I wasn't eating enough fats. It was a lot of lean meats and processed mm -hmm. meats as well. So for those reasons, I wasn't able to experience the full benefits at the beginning. Understood. Wow. That's a... I mean, that might be, I know people do it with their kids, but like, that's the youngest I've ever heard of a person just trying carnivore <laughs> at 16 years old. That's yeah, cool. I guess, yeah, pretty young at the time. Now there's a lot more like younger kids now. Right, right. Yeah, yeah I've seen that too. And it's like, so when you, so you didn't know you had mold poisoning, but you just didn't feel good. And I guess that was the first attempt at, carnivore is mold something that causes people to gain weight uh yeah mold can mold and parasites so i didn't know this until i was researching parasites to make a video on it but um head lice is a form of so i guess it's like ticks where you can get lyme disease head lice is a form of parasite and i was living in south america at the time and i had it, it's a huge problem there head lice so I had that for like a year and a half. So I'm thinking based off of that, plus the mold, because I know parasites and mold can cause an inflammatory response within the body. So then that would be like weight gain or water retention. And so then that caused some edema. And of course, lymphatic system kind of shut down a bit and um, yeah, inflammation. So the mold and parasites caused that. And so then I assumed that was weight gain. So then I found keto and then eventually carnivore because I thought I needed to lose weight. And that was just it. I see. And does carnivore help with people that have mold or parasites, or is that an unrelated treatment? It can definitely help. Um, you do need to take other things to actually pull them out and kill them, but parasites and mold thrive off of damp environments. And when you're uh, removing any form of sugar carbohydrates, because sugars, carbohydrates in general, um, they're all damp. So if you're ingesting that, you're just feeding the parasites and the mold. So if you remove all of that, you're not directly feeding them. They won't just automatically die off. You still need to take some form of binder or if you take antibiotics or something like that to kill it, to then pull it out. So it definitely makes a huge difference and helps. Okay. That's very cool. And like, how do you, how do you, how does one find out that they have mold and parasites like is that a blood test or urine test or what is that yeah there's a lot of different ways that you can um 
find out about that, I did a bunch of urine tests, also some blood tests. Um, there's also more conventional ways, like you can put um, a camera down your throat and then it can scan and somehow you check, it can check for the parasites. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but usually through blood tests, you can check through the blood or you can check through an organ if you take some tissue. Um, yeah, so that's how you would test for both things. For both things, okay. And it, it makes sense, like, you get mold by being in a moldy environment, area, right, environment, um, which I'm learning that I'll, there's a lot more mold out there than I originally thought. Something like 50% yeah. of homes in the U.S. have mold. I, I think more now. Really? Yeah. Jeez, so scary. It's like, you. it makes you want to buy, like, a new, a brand new house or something that... <laughs> um that, that wouldn't have that you know at least on day one um but as far as like the parasite um treatment or not parasite treatment but like do you get parasites from what you're eating or is that an environmental thing as well uh it's a mix of both originally i think it was the lice which i was just thinking about a couple days ago even that that was like the initial part um then when i initially got huge and severe acne and eczema i was uh on the coast for vacation in 2020 and i ate this fish and i don't think it was sourced from a great place and it tasted off there's something wrong about it mm. and there's a lot of parasites that can be in fish if it's not well sourced or if it's bad quality or if it's obviously rotten so you can get it like that but you can also just get it by walking out on dirt or sand in an unclean environment. And I've been learning about hookworms a lot recently, and those can just penetrate straight through your skin, which is just absolutely disgusting to me. So that's another way that you can get parasites. Nasty, okay. Yeah. And then so with, the, with mold and parasites, you said it could show up as like weight gain, it can show up as inflammation. Is the acne also related to that? Because I saw, I think it was on your Instagram. I mean, it was like, Super it was, noticeable. was that like acne scars or like what do they call that? I I don't know what to call it because I've been searching up a lot of rosacea, eczema, okay. and it looks like a weird combination of a bunch of things plus like rash. So I'm not exactly sure what it was, but yeah, um, certain parasites can cause that. Um, there was this one parasite, I don't remember the name of it because it had a really weird name, that lives in fish and it causes that. So then I figured it was definitely that fish since it was the day after i ate it that i just had this reaction oh, holy so, smokes okay yeah. and you were living in paraguay at the time i was living at that point we already moved to croatia you were in croatia okay. a bit all over the place yeah yeah absolutely okay that's wild and then the detox for you know, what, what are you taking as far as you maybe you mentioned some like binders or things like that for mold is the detox similar for parasites and mold or are those two different protocols they're uh they're very fairly similar uh mold you can also benefit from uh sweating so sauna especially infrared sauna ozone therapy as well i haven't done ozone well okay i have done some form of ozone therapy not the one where you take out the blood circulate it and then put it back in um, but yeah, for parasites and mold is fairly similar. You take binders. I took um, zeolite, bentonite clay, what else? Activated charcoal and diatomaceous earth. And you take a bunch of those things and they really just pull it out. Um, wow. Yeah. Oh, and also um, a bunch of essential oils uh, for the parasites, as well as I guess it works for the mold as well, like oregano oil. I took that mm. directly and that is really potent, but at least you know it's burning off everything. It feels like it's working, right? When you ingest that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's, yeah, that's interesting. And then, so like, how did this, like how does this affect, obviously the acne, we know how the acne would affect you like day to day, but like, as far as like the other symptoms, like what was it like to have walk those. around with mold poisoning and, parasite issues yeah um so at towards the end of 2019 i was still going to a professional ballet school so it's like you basically live there because you're there for that long and i had a drop 
all of my classes except for the basic ballet technique, which is about an hour and a half, just because I had to pass the exam mm -hmm. uh, because I just was so chronically fatigued. If I bent back during the class, I'd come up and I would just see stars and I would need a lot of time to just recenter myself. And I remember at the end of that year when we had our exams, because I was at a higher level in the, because it's eight years of ballet training, I was in the fifth year. So we had to perform a solo in the exams. And I remember after performing the solo, I came out and I just collapsed and I couldn't like get up off the floor for like a full five minutes. And my classmates, I think, just thought I was being silly or something. But yeah, so chronic fatigue. I was also depressed mm. for a very long time. And recently, as of like a month and a half ago, I got parasites again through tap water. So through water again, that's a way you could get parasites. Um, I got a miniature depressive episode, but I realized it was associated with the parasites. So there's a lot of um, psych psychological issues that you can get from the parasites, as well as they also trigger, auto trigger autoimmune disorders. Okay, interesting. And then when you first got tested for mold, is it is this what they call a SIRS test? C I R S yes. or is this something else? It's something else, but I've been looking recently more into SIRS and I think that I probably had that. It's just an I think basically it's an inflammatory response within the body from whatever the root cause would be, which is what I had. Okay, gotcha. Do you remember the type of, I'm just interested for myself personally, <laughs> yeah. do you remember the um, specific blood test for mold? Like, is that something that you can go online and order or did a doctor have to I think you would need write a, you a script for it? I think you would need a specific test. Either it's a specific test or uh, you take a blood test and then you're looking specifically for things. There's also mold tests that you can do, but the thing is that they're kind of difficult to know whether or not it's really accurate because it's hard to test for mold. Mm. So I did blood tests, but I also did like some alternative testing with the frequency therapies that I mentioned to you earlier. Yes, let's talk so about that. Them. Yeah, so that's how we came to the conclusion that it was the mold. Apart from looking back, it was very clearly obvious that my whole school was covered in mold. I just was too out of it to realize at the time. Jeez. Okay. So you're all fatigued. Is this? Yeah. Um, I'm sure so many people deal with this and they just have no idea yeah. what's going on. So lucky for you, you, <laughs> you were, I guess, curious enough to continue to research it and find out or like how did you you know make the step from like i don't feel good to i need to find a solution and finding a solution yeah well um my mom has been mostly the one doing all the therapies for me in the end of 2019 beginning 2020 we did go to a clinic for um specific frequency therapies and it didn't really help so much and because they didn't really know what else they were looking for really okay. uh, we also went to a bunch of other forms of alternative medicines because we haven't had success with the conventional way in the past so we just skipped that completely um but my mom she was kind of on top she was doing the urine tests and testing through that as well as the frequency therapy so she knew a lot of stuff that i didn't but it wasn't until around November of 2021 that I was so overly large in size for a ballet dancer. Plus I had the skin, plus I was depressed. I auditioned for this ballet company and they didn't want me and that kind of sent me over the edge. And from there on, I just thought, okay, I need to change something. And then that's when I really got like the flame under my bottom to start uh, researching what to do. Very interesting. Yeah, because you would assume with the hours and hours of practice every day, and you were eating, what, mostly a decent diet at the time? Yeah, uh, in towards like the last four to five months of 2018, I was kind of starving myself because that's the typical ballet thing. You always think that you're too big. I was living alone too, so I couldn't be monitored on that. I see. Um, yeah, so I was doing that. And then in 2019, it was mostly animal-based with some like dark chocolate plus hot sauces plus cheese. 
-hmm. And then in 2020, 2021, until I switched over to carnivore, it was a lot of animal based as well. Um, but I was still having nut butters and I don't think that was helping at all. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then, so then you eventually go all carnivore and you lost 40 pounds. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's yeah. awesome. Um, Cause yeah, it'd be so surprising. I'm sure for you to be like, I'm moving around like crazy. I'm like limiting my caloric consumption and I'm still overweight. Um, how much was the, so when you switched to carnivore, like do you attribute that to the majority of the weight loss or was it also getting rid of the mold and parasites as well? Right. Uh, yeah. Um, well, so switching over to carnivore because I drastically reduced my meal portion size. So I probably approached it in the worst way possible. Okay. But it worked. Uh, so yeah, I drastically uh, reduced my portion size and was eating a lot of jello. So I would make jello and that kind of just like pulled a lot of whatever I needed to detox out somehow. Hmm. Um, as well as, yeah, we were doing therapies at the time to also clean out the mold. So carnivore definitely was like the kickstart for allowing my body to heal since I wasn't eating just like the tiny little extra things like the chocolate or sauce or whatever. Just removing that was able to give me the jump start that I needed for the weight loss. Right. Okay. And that, that makes sense. And then on carnivore, I mean, you don't, do you count calories or are you just kind of eat until you're full and move on? I eat until I'm full and then I, yeah. At the okay. beginning I was, yeah, really particular and had like really small portions. Now I just eat. Yeah, same. Yeah, I, I know that's, the, that's like one of the best parts about it. Yeah. Because who likes counting like, calories and like learning what your macros are and then you're well, like, you're all consumed by these numbers on uh, my fitness pal or whatever you're using it's a total it's a, just a total bummer yeah uh, it's just a bit stressful and a bit anxiety inducing you have to like track everything and you know what was i eating today was it too much too little yeah right and what does your carnivore diet look like like what foods do you include uh, yeah, so now um, it's a lot of beef and butter. Um, I've recently tried some bison. Uh, but yeah, so I'll eat most animal products. I just don't eat a lot of dairy, mainly so that I can stay lean for ballet. Um, mm -hmm. But I have no problem with it, so I consume that. But yeah, so I eat chicken, eggs, any kind of meats. I don't have any form of uh, histamine intolerance, so I'm pretty fine with everything. Nice. Okay. That's great. And um, do you eat like, do you have breakfast? Do you intermittent fast or you just, is it, what does that look like? Yeah. Uh, so because of the schedule I'm on now, which will change soon, I've been eating really early in the morning, which I don't particularly like. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll have breakfast and then a main meal at around 3.30. So my breakfast is kind of at 6 to 7 a.m. Uh, and then my main meal at 3.30, just because I'm not really that hungry because I fill up with the fat. And then sometimes I'll have a small snack in the evening, but I don't particularly get that hungry. So it's kind of like two meals a day. Okay, nice. And do you yeah. do coffee? I do still do coffee. I took a break from coffee for like a week and a half-ish, and I didn't really notice a difference or any like improvements. If anything, I feel it helps me a bit because I train so much that I need that extra yeah, since it's not like a normal human way of training, I feel that it helps a bit. Yeah, what is the training like? Like, what, like, walk me through that. Cause I think a lot of people may be. So a lot of people ask me, like, oh, well, how? Cause I'm in the gym a lot, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll ask me, like, well, how do you lift weights if you're not eating any carbohydrates? Right. Or like, how do, you know, if I'm going to go on a run or if I'm going to, you know, play a sport or whatever, people are assuming that they need carbohydrates for the energy. So like, yeah. what is like, what's the training like, I guess, to be a ballerina? And like, what did you notice when you cut carbs? Like, do you have less energy, you have more energy? Definitely more energy. 
Mm -hmm. um, during the summer, because for ballet training during the summer, they do these summer intensives. So they're a lot more intense. It's like to kickstart the season. So uh, in June, July, when I was doing those intensives last year, and then this year again, of course, I did have some um, just fruit juice added to my water because it's like a five hour day of training and you have like five minute breaks. I don't have time to eat wow. a steak and like get that quick boost of energy to go in. So then I would have some like fruit juice, but nothing like mm -hmm. that. Uh, but yeah, so the training, uh, it's a lot more intense if it's private. So most of my training has been private just because I've had to really get ahead since I started late. Um, so it's, probably around four to five hours a day, but that includes a lot of like hours of stretching. So not particularly active exercise, but at the same time, still a lot of intensive. It's a lot of like cardio type of training, I guess you could say. Gotcha. And you said it's about five hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> Holy smokes. Cause yeah. I saw some of your videos and it's like the, I mean, you need a lot of athleticism, but you're also like, Spinning yeah. and jumping and for five hours. That's crazy. I mean, I guess that's like what it takes to yeah. know where you where you want to go. I don't know much about that, the you know, the world of ballerinas, but I guess that's you know, like you're training like a professional athlete, really. Yeah, kind of. It's also really mentally draining. And I think that's the main difference between like ballet versus just your normal sport, since there's so much so many nuances so much attention to detail you're constantly thinking about it so then at the end of the training i'm just kind of i can't think of anything else because my just brain is drained from just thinking about all these tiny little details like you have to think about just like this bone here on the thumb if i'm sticking it up doing anything that's bad i have to correct that it's like all these tiny little details you constantly have to be thinking of so it really is mentally draining as well as the physical aspect interesting okay so like i guess the aesthetic part of the dance right would you call it a dance yeah okay so like all those little like minor details uh, that's that's fascinating and then is it i'm just kind of interested in this world now is it like improv or do you learn like a particular i don't know uh dance or song or something like that and you stick to that move by move yeah, so every single class is pretty much the same. There's a certain order of exercises that you have to go to that you start at the bar. So you're holding onto a bar to help so that you can just kind of center yourself and warm up for the center. And that is sometimes 30 to 45 minutes. And then you go into the center and then you repeat the same exact things that you did at the bar, but without holding on to something. Plus you add turns, jumps, diagonals, and a lot of other things. I got you. Okay. That's, in, that's interesting. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, and now from like, so now you've gone full carnivore. You've, have you detox completely from these other things or are you still working on a detox? So for the mold, I believe I'm fully detoxed. I have also detox radiation, but I'd like to keep that up anyway, just because the environment isn't great mm -hmm. nowadays i also just recently flew so i'd like to detox from that um so i'm not exactly sure how detoxed i am from that but i'm gonna detox from that again as well as the parasites i'm currently still detoxing because those are difficult <laughs> and what is the radiation what's that about yeah so just before moving to the us uh, my mom and i were living in serbia and around 20 years ago, the U.S. and NATO bombed them with depleted uranium. So that's a heavy metal plus radiation. And they haven't really done anything since 1999, 2000, more so 2000, I think. Uh, they haven't really done anything to clean it. Um, and I was doing a lot of research. And depleted uranium, if anything, it just grows and spreads more. It doesn't naturally reduce the radiation. So it would take like a good century to ever be like at a safety point uh so that was where yeah the radiation came into play holy smokes so unlucky unlucky that it's just location based yeah wow it's crazy yeah you've yeah. been through a lot of different a lot of different things but good for you like you've got you know you've got a really good mindset about it and you're you know tackling these problems head on so 
Yeah, it's make it's keeping things interesting. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then you also touched on um, heavy metals. So how does that how did that come into play, and how did you know that you had an issue with that? Like, what are the symptoms there? Yeah. Um, so the heavy metal poisoning was twice. Uh, the first time was in 2018. We had a farm in the mountains. Okay, hills. They weren't really mountains in uh, Uruguay and South America. So that's why I was living alone because it was like three hours away from the city for my ballet training. It was impossible to commute that every day. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a well and the water and soil there is really high in iron. And since I was a bit lazy at the time, I was just drinking the water straight and not using a filter. So I got heavy metal poisoning from the iron, which we found out through a blood test that I had. Um, heavy metal poisoning and then funnily enough one year later i did another blood test and i had anemia so it was a complete opposite <laughs> okay so it was iron that's what was the iron. the metal okay yeah iron and then most recently the uh, uranium because that's also a heavy metal apart from being uh, radioactive it's uh, heavy metal interesting okay yeah, when I think of heavy metals, I think of, I guess probably most people would think of mercury. Mercury, yeah. Right. Okay. That's man, that's fascinating. And then, like from here on out, like, do you think you'll do you think carnivore diet is something that you'll do for the rest of your life, or do you think it's better to switch it at some point, or what's your feelings about that? Uh, well, I'm going to say carnivore until I feel like I've fully cleared out everything just because I don't want to reintroduce anything that could be some form of carbohydrate to cause any dampness to let mold or parasites grow. But uh, I do want to switch more to an animal based form of diet just because I want my body to still be adaptable just in mm -hmm. case I'm somewhere and can't have something like I would probably never introduce vegetables. Uh, but some fruits, probably, and that's about it, I think. Right. Yeah, it's funny that, I don't know, maybe you think about this, too, but like when I was a kid, like, I hated my vegetables. And they oh. would, like, offer, you know, they bribe me, basically. <laughs> right, yeah. And now there's adults that are, like, they still cling to eating vegetables and look at, you know, the carnivore diet is just being crazy. But I'm like, do you even like those things? Yeah, exactly. And the way you have to prepare it, you had to exaggerate everything to get the flavors out of it. Like, I mean, I used to like some mushrooms on a steak, you know, some other things like that. But it's like, man, like, as far as taste goes, especially what I've noticed is animal fat. Mm -hmm. Like where the fatty portion of a steak, it just has this I mean, you just get this feeling like you're being nourished and i've never got that from a potato or a broccoli or basically any other kind of food any kind of like natural food right yeah it's like you have to add a lot of spices and you have to do a lot to it for it to just kind of taste good it's not like if you just had the raw thing that it would taste good whereas with meat if you just cook the meat plain it still tastes amazing Right, right. And there's all those vegetables, like certain kind of beans and stuff. You have to cook them a certain way or you'll like die. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's crazy. But I could see fruit, you know, being, I know there's like a lot of people just get so bananas over like carnivore versus like you're not carnivoring hard enough versus like yeah. animal based. It's so crazy to like eat fruit. I mean, I don't know. I think if it, if that individual is doing well, it's probably not that big of a deal. And I think for most, I guess, maybe most like normal people without serious ailments would do fine with having some fruit or whatever. But I think for, uh, I guess the majority of people, it's like, like processed foods and the carbohydrates is really what's crushing them. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely need to remove those for at least okay the processed food definitely we need to remove that but the fruits i guess it, it's depends on the person right yeah yeah um so carnivore possibly for life uh, maybe animal based for life yeah that's cool and then what are your plans as far as like 
um, like being a ballerina? Like, what is that? What What are the goals there? Like, what does that look like over the next five years? Yeah. Uh, so I was just offered a position with a company. So it works a bit different in the U.S. as in it does with Europe. Uh, with in Europe, I could be hired, I guess, immediately once I'm 18. Here, you kind of need to be like an apprentice or a trainee. So for now, I have a position as a trainee with a company in Dallas. So I'll be starting that in a bit. Um, but yeah, my plans, I guess, are to dance for maybe five to 10 years. It's a fairly short career just because it's really hard on the body. So after a period of time, it's just not really doable. No one wants to watch you if you're not dancing too well. So that's, uh, yeah, that for now. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. I guess that's the career of an athlete, right? Yeah. You put your life into something and eventually it's like, you got to move on and do something else. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about that. Um, I wanted to talk about the uh, frequency okay. therapy. I don't know exactly what that is. Is that sound frequency? Right. Like, um, what is that? Yeah, it's a mix of both. So I began um, doing some other, so a bit of light therapies. We went to this one woman that had this, um, I guess it's, yeah, it's called a beamer and it's a frequency mat and you would lay on it. And through that, oh. the frequency's playing, but you don't hear it. You don't see it. You don't feel it. I guess it's just the frequency coming out through the electrical connections of it i'm not exactly sure is this what like the, a grounding mat kind of okay yeah but like you specifically tune it to the certain frequency so it could work as a grounding mat um so there was that as well as she also had these weird like cubes and that would give off light and that was a certain frequency so it's kind of like i guess red light therapy or blue light therapy but it also had the frequency to it as well uh, I also did a bit of, um, oh gosh, like magnetic therapy. <laughs> so using magnets, hmm. um, and those people would also do a bit of iridology so that they could see what exactly it was that they were looking for. That was not so effective. It was a bit effective for more, I guess, like psychological or emotional trauma, stuff like that. It was a bit helpful. Um, but most recently we've been using like a Rife machine and that you take a sample of DNA, so like a hair or a nail, and then you would put it into the machine and the machine is emitting the frequency directly to that piece of DNA sample. And with the DNA, yeah, with the DNA sample, you can test what the problem is going on or with like a urine test, which is what we were doing before or through the DNA test. And then directly it'll tell you what frequencies you need and potentially what you have. And then it'll just work based off of the test. Okay. And you're just, are you like laying down on this mat when there's cubes surrounding you or what does that look like? Yeah. Uh, so when we were going to this woman that had the machines, I had to lay on the mat or you can sit on the mat. Like you could just place the mat on a chair and like lay against it or you lay on the mat. Um, and the light things, like I'd have to place my feet or hands on them. But the machine that we have now, I just put the DNA and it just remotely does it. So my nail with that DNA strand is tuning into my own personal frequency. So then it's giving the frequencies I need to my frequency. So I don't need, it, like it could be running right now and healing me and I don't have to be anywhere physically near it, which is a cool part. It's a bit creepy and weird, but it works. And it, yeah, it's really efficient. Wait a second. So you got this DNA machine that's like in another room. You go by, yeah. you take a piece of hair, and you put it on there. And then how does that get back to, to you? Uh, well, so I guess my myself, I have a personal frequency wavelength, which is, um, I guess, the frequency of my DNA. Plus, what's cool is that I obviously share similar DNA frequency with, for example, my sister, my mom, my dad. So whatever I'm healing, to some extent, they're getting that therapy as well because we ha we share similar DNA. So that's how it's a bit weird. Yeah, so um, like, how is it passing? Like, 
how is it getting like back to you in a way? Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, so the frequency- like, Is there like a frequency like aura around you or something? I guess so, like, you know, if you have like your aura, that could also be like your frequency. Um, so the frequency that, w let's say like the number frequency 725 is from old. My frequency is, I don't know, 821. So they're send the machine is sending the mold healing frequency to my own personal, let's say like frequency aura. And so then that would energetically just be healing me, I guess. I'm not sure exactly the mechanics, but that's sure. from my understanding how it works. Wow. Okay, that is wild stuff. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, yeah. Hey, I mean, honestly, all this stuff sounds crazy until yeah. it works, right? Yeah. That's why I appreciate anecdotes so much because that becomes science, you know, 10, 20 years in the future. Um, like uh, my one of my favorite people ever, you know, Wim Hof. Yeah. The Iceman. Yeah. He was yeah, like, exactly. he was looked at as being so crazy. And then they finally tested him and, or, and tested people that were doing his method and changed scientific textbooks because of it. And yeah. I feel like there's something about carnivore, whether it's the meat being a superfood or the reduction or removal of carbohydrates and these other things, um, probably a little bit of both, probably. that years from now, people are gonna look back and be like, oh yeah, that of course, of course carnivore, that, that totally makes sense. Um, but right now it's like, seems super controversial. How does your, your mom seems very supportive of it. Like, is it difficult like with, friends and other people like that who are like aren't you gonna have some pizza or birthday cake with us or uh yeah so i guess like most of my family so my sister isn't carnivore and neither is my father if anything strictly against it um but yeah so my mom is mostly animal based to carnivore she has some chocolate and wine and that's about it um mm. so she's really supportive of it my friends so far they don't really care. They're like, yep, do what works for you. Um, here, I've met a lot of animal-based people. So, of course, they know about it and they're cool with it. So, I haven't really had a problem with it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah that's good to hear. I know for a lot of people, it's very hard, the pressures of family situations or, I don't know, the work pizza party or, like, whatever they have going on where they feel like food is sort of this – in a lot of ways it is, it's like, it can be cultural or just a way to connect people. And then you kind of feel like an outsider because you're like bringing a ribeye to your cousin's <laughs> birthday party or something like that. You just kind of feel like a freak. Yeah, well, that's also partly why I wanted to continue drinking coffee. That way it's not like a shock to my system. That way it's not so awkward. If I want to meet someone new, I don't have to commit to a lunch or meeting for a meal. I can just say, let's meet for coffee. And then you can crack or break the ice on that weird conversation at a later point right yeah yeah, yeah. you meet for dinner they're like i can't believe this chick just ate like 16 ounce ribeye and you know slathered it in butter yeah <laughs> yeah they would just be a bit odd yeah yeah no, i get that and i guess you know to your point it's becoming less and less weird, weird. and more yeah. and more accepted Definitely, probably in Texas, anyways. A lot of a lot yeah. of good steak down there, right? Yeah, I haven't been to too many places just because I'm still worried because of the parasites and everything of the quality of foods. But I have been to a few places, and it's good. But what do you do as far as getting the best? Because yeah, you mentioned that a couple of times. As far as the quality of of meat, like, do you go to a local rancher or grocery uh -huh. store, like a good grocery store that you trust? Yeah, so when we first arrived, we were using, um, I think it's sprouts, and we were just using the antibiotic-free grass-fed, grass-finished with nothing in it. Um, we were just sticking with ground beef just to be on the safe side because they put a lot more stuff into pork mm -hmm. um, products as well as chicken with the hormones and everything. But now we're using, um, I believe it's wild pastures and then a bit of the beef initiative. So that's a bit more local. 
the beef initiative. It'll, I guess, connect you with like local ranchers and then you sell off of that. So. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Good places to look into. Beef initiative. Yeah, I, I believe it's just one big site and they have many, many local ranchers from all the different states that can then post their products onto the site and then you can buy from the one that's from your state. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'm definitely going to, I've been, this is one thing I've been meaning to do is get like real local. Real um, local. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about raw milk? Have you ever done that? No, uh, not yet. Mainly because I don't want the carbs from it. Um, yeah. I don't, no, I don't do a lot of dairy, just butter. I, I will have some cheese. So I've had raw cheese. And that's okay. really good compared to, of course, pasteurized cheese. So I have enjoyed that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It's cheese is kind of, I guess this is the same for you, but that's like my, it's almost like a cheat. Yeah. For me, is to like have some cheese, which just sounds so ridiculous to, <laughs> to say, yeah. 99.9% .9 of people. Um, <laughs> well, cool. Well, what is, um, where is a where can people connect with you and and find you online i think i found you over youtube actually oh really i think it was youtube or Instagram. i saw you were at KetoCon. i was right? at KetoCon, yeah yeah how was that a lot of fun i volunteered so i got to meet a lot of the speakers which was really cool that's cool yeah, so that was cool. But yeah, generally it was a lot of fun. I got to uh, taste test a lot of the carnivore products, maybe a bit excessively. So. Oh, really? <laughs> so okay. Sure, yeah. Is it just a bunch of like speeches, and then is it like vendors there, or like what? Like what is that? Yeah, so it's it's a lot of fun. So I definitely recommend going to it. Um, it's a lot of vendors, and then a lot of people talking. So there was Ken Berry, Sean Baker, Dr. Kiltz. Um, some other big names, of course, and then a lot of the big names in the keto industry, obviously, mm -hmm. since it's called KetoCon, who I don't really know of. I don't know a lot of them. Uh, so mm -hmm. they talk on specific things. Um, like there was one speech, which I'm looking forward to the playback that was talking about the thyroid that everyone was saying that was amazing, but I couldn't go because I was volunteering at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a lot of that. And then I believe the last two days, they begin to include... Um, more so the people who are selling products, they have like 45 minutes to an hour to just kind of pitch their products. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Like carnivore yeah. snacks. Yeah. Like <laughs> well, no, it was more like things like um, there was this company uh, that did these essential oils and they did this certain mixture and they were explaining why you would need it to calm down the nervous system if you have high mm -hmm. stress or anxiety, how to use it, how it could benefit you. Um, there was another company that had this treatment thing, and I'm not exactly sure what it was. I'm not sure if it was like rip, rip, chiro, something that you like went into this weird tube box thing, and it was doing something. So whatever therapy that was, they were explaining that. And then there was this also this um, like bio scan. So then they're explaining like why you should go and use it. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That does sound cool. Good idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of getting in there, I guess, for, for free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had access. yeah. It was, it was great. Cause I had access to all the VIP breakout rooms. So that's where you can ask directly personal wow. questions to the speaker. So that was really cool. That's awesome. And Ken Berry and Sean Bay, all those guys that you mentioned are just awesome. Yeah. Um, so you're so much helpful information. That's the same way that I got it. I think Michaela Peterson maybe was the first person that I saw talking about it mm -hmm. on Joe Rogan. Then it was Sean Baker. And then I found Ken Berry not, not too long ago. And his YouTube channel is awesome as well. But yeah. I want to ask about, so your YouTube channel. So where can people connect with, with you? So I know you're on YouTube and Instagram. What's the... Um, I guess what's the uh, the the account name or tagline? What do they call it? Username. Username, yeah, username. There we go. Uh, so yeah, you can find me almost everywhere at Carnivore Ballerina. The only one that's different is my Twitter, which is my name, Olivia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I have yeah, uh, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter for now. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. And there's a lot of um, really cool like ballerina posts, but also. Yeah. 
carnivore posts. So. Yeah, I like to mix them up to make it different and interesting. Well, yeah, so you have, you know, a unique um, life experience with everything that you've gone through. And then how many people are ballerinas? 0.001%. So it's, it's very cool that you've got, you know, unique education and the carnivore side and all that stuff. And then also, so I think it's actually, actually makes for a pretty cool uh, Instagram account. So yeah. people, people should definitely follow you. Yeah, well, I hope they do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, awesome. Well, great. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. This was a blast. I had a lot yeah, of fun. Well, thank you for having me.